Very good to have all of you in Sunday school this morning. Change the time on us, so it'll take a little while to get used to the change of time. Turn to John 3, verse 19. Gospel of John, chapter number 3, verse number 19. And this is the condemnation that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Father, I pray that you bless your word, anoint it, anoint this messenger. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Now, what I'm going to give you this morning I think is very relevant for this time, for right now, 2018. You know, as I've said to you before, a, a, a preacher, a minister, has to minister to his generation. And 100 years ago, 150, 200 years ago, you have, a, you have wonderful preachers. And you've got their sermons, and uh, there's so much good material that you can get from, that, uh, from their work and from the commentaries were written then. But this is 2018. And uh, a lot of people didn't think we'd be here this long, but we're here we are. The Lord hadn't come back yet. And we have to minister to this generation. In other words, where you live, what you have to face when you go outside this building today and tomorrow and this coming week. The world that you live in, the real world, not a fake world, not a, uh, not a fabrication. I've told you about a lady by the name of uh, Linda uh, Kimball. And uh, I don't know if you remember her or not, but this lady is, uh, you can Google her, Linda Kimball, K-I-M-B-A-L-L. -L. You can Google, uh, Google this lady right here, and you'll be amazed at the material that she has available. First of all, she's very smart. Secondly, she's a thinker. And you put those two together, and you're going to come up with some, uh, with some discernment. You're going to be able to see things. And that's what we must be able to do. We must be able to see the world we live in so we can make the right choices that are absolutely necessary for us to make. It's absolutely necessary. Because, for example, this coming Tuesday, you're going to be making choices. You're going to the polls, I hope you are, and voting. And uh, early voting's over this coming Tuesday is the election, November the 6th. You're going to be voting for senators, governors, representatives, and the people who run the country and run the government. You're going to be voting for them. You need to know what you believe and where you stand. You need to know the position of the church, what it's here for. You need to know what's he where it's headed. You need to know these things. I'm going to give you a treatise this morning that she's written. I'm going to made some notes from it. And the title of this is The Rise of the Global Church of Lucifer. I firmly believe that we are on the cusp of a one world government and a one world church. Everything that grabs a Bible and jumps up in front of you and claims to be a preacher of the Word of God is not God's man. That includes the Baptist church. But this lady right here uh, has a very good take. So I'm just to start reading without wasting a lot of time. To read verbatim. Since the Renaissance, powerfully influential, satanically overshadowed occult secret societies existing at the highest levels of the Christian church, government and society have been both the intelligentsia and the real powers behind what has been variously called the progressive underground of the anti-establishment, the 60s sexual liberation movement, and the anti-tradition counterculture. The aim of the societies is twofold. First, the total destruction of the old order based on faithful Christianity with emphasis on the Genesis account of creation, ex nihilo. That's a Latin term that simply means come forth from nothing, created from nothing. Uh, the account of creation of ex nihilo, original sin, Jesus Christ God incarnate, immutable truth, moral absolutes and all tradition arising therefrom, and second, the ushering in of an occult new age, a socialistic kingdom of God, pantheistic new world order here on earth. 
The Occult Underground, The Dawn of the New Age, and The Occult Establishment by James Webb. So she quotes from him. A young man goes off to Bible college, the first thing he gets is what's called the documentary hypothesis, Graf Wellhausen. He'll get it. Any Bible college in this country, that's a liberal Bible college, that's what they're going to ram down his throat. What's that mean? It means that they're going to tell him that the people who wrote the Pentateuch was not Moses, but a number of people wrote it. Documentary hypothesis. JP, this, that, this, that, this, that. By the time they get done with him, he will no longer believe in the inspiration of Scripture, but they'll ordain him, and they'll send him out into these mainline Protestant churches. The churches in America are full of reverends, folks, that have never been saved. They don't believe the Bible. They don't believe the new birth. They don't believe in the virgin birth. They don't believe in the blood atonement. They don't believe in the inspiration of Scriptures. They don't believe any of this. Yet, they shroud their unbelief in religious terms, religious cliches. They pander to the people, and they appear to be so compassionate and so loving and so forth and so on. These reverends up here somewhere, I forget, some place in some country, part of the country, the other day blessed the abortion clinics in America. They blessed them. They blessed them, see. All right, now these are the people I'm talking about. They're wolves in sheep's clothing. They're not Christians. These people are not your brothers and sisters. They're the enemy of the cross. But in any event, the, the, since the Renaissance, powerful, powerfully influential, satanically overshadowed society, so forth and so on. So it is definitely here, and it has taken root. Today, occult societies, the highest level of global power and influence, operate through a vast organizational network. A global occult pantheistic New Age movement, the Age of Aquarius, linked to over 10,000 organizations here in America alone. Satan does not put all of his eggs in one basket. He's very cunning in the way he does things. The Age of Aquarius has to do with what's called the precession of the equinoxes. Why one age? Why one age? Why another age? Because if you look into the sky at night, and look at, the, look at the stars, then watch where the sun comes up each morning, you'll see that a gradual progression is taking place, a recession, really, precession is taking place. And it takes 25,000 years for that to happen. I know it gets complicated, I understand all of that. But man from ancient times has been, has been observing this phenomena. And uh, this is why the, the musical hair came out... Uh, 40, 50 years ago, and they talked to the song Age of Aquarius, the dawning of the Age of Aquarius, the water bearer, a new age for mankind. This is why you have the New Age movement. They associate it with that. So it is the opening up of the spiritual power of mankind. Now he's able to reach up into the skies. He's free and loosed from all of his of all of his moral bonds and all of the all of the, of the religious uh, 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 you know that holds him and holds him in sway. He's free from all of this now. Now the sexual revolution. Now you have the flower children. Now you have Woodstock. How many of you know what Woodstock was about? I was alive, all about Woodstock, and all about it. And all of this stuff, it, it didn't just happen. It is part of this great river of rebellion against God that you find yourself, the culture of America is deeply rooted in it now. They may, you have a lot of kids in this country who may never heard of Woodstock, may not know the difference between the age of Aquarius and Pluto. Ha! But the thing is, they're part of it. You don't have to, be, you don't have to know anything about it to be part of it. They're living it. They're living it. And that's what you're watching happen right now. New Age movement received a start 1875, the founding of the Theosophical Society by Helena Petrovna Bolovatsky. She's a Russian. In his book, Earth's Earliest Ages, which I highly recommend, if you only read one book in the next six months, read G.H. Pember's Earth's Earliest Ages. Folks, I've been through books. I know books. I've got books piled up that are nothing but garbage. But if you'll read that book right there, it'll open you up to what's going on today, and it's over 100 years old. G.H. Pember, Earth's Earliest Ages. And he talks about this. He opens it up. He'll lay the foundation for you. And uh, the English theologian G.H. Pember writes that Blavatsky was chosen by the Brotherhood to carry out a mission. And who's the Brotherhood? What's well, demons, of course. 
First, here is her mission. The formation of the nucleus of a universal brotherhood. Second, the destruction of the revealed word of God by way of transformation to unity with the world system process. This devilish process will be carried out by spiritually illumined change agent theologians, priests, and intellectuals who would transform it completely. And this has been happening right under our very nose. You ever wondered why some young man goes off to Bible college and he's so full of fire and loves the Lord and, and he's ready to go out and preach and, and you know see people converted and then he comes back and he has this smirk on his face. He's got this, he's got this condescending patronizing attitude because he knows something you don't know. You see, they brainwashed him in the Bible college, but that's what goes on. Bailey explains a specially selected theologian priest will be overshadowed and then possessed by masters in a process of initiation. In plainer words, once they raise them to a certain level, the demonic powers take control. You see, the Bible says, give no place to the devil. You have certain safeguards built in. There are certain things about you that God gave you to protect you from Satan. But if you allow him, he will possess you. Yes, he will. He will possess you. And so uh, prepared disciples and highly evolved men and women. From the, from, the, from the earliest age, a child goes off to the public school system in the United States of America and they are brainwashed with evolution. They are inundated constantly with evolution. <coughs> it's almost as if Darwin was the smartest man that ever lived. And he's one of the dumbest. <laughs> but, they, but evolution, they ram it down their throats. And so they begin to understand that evolution is a process and everything that happens is subject to that process, whether it be physical, biological evolution or spiritual evolution. Then you get into the real issue. It's not so much the biological evolution. Science can disprove that. It's the spiritual evolution. That's what's happening to mankind. He's going through a transformation. The day before yesterday or yesterday at the University of Florida, Florida State University, I think it was, down in Florida, you had some young people standing on the campus and they're holding signs supporting Republicans. That's all they're doing. They're holding signs. This girl walks up in front of them and tells them, don't you understand that you're a fascist? She had on her, on her blouse, she had two pens. One was the was the hammer and sickle. What does that represent? And the other one was the swastika. All right. The swastika had a bar through it as if it was marked out like stop, you know. But the hammer and sickle prominently displayed. I'm a communist. That's what she's saying. But you know what she did? To the young man standing there holding his sign, she was holding a chocolate milk in her hand. She threw it on him. She threw it on him. Did you know that to their credit, Florida State University is going to prosecute her for assault? They should. That's not America. I don't know what hell hole she thinks she lives in, but that's not America. The freedom of speech is sacred. If you lose your freedom of speech, throw your Bible out the back door. You'll never be able to preach it again. So, she accused him of being a fascist while she was a fascist. What's the difference? You know what a fascist and a communist, the biggest difference between the two? Communism owns the means of production. Fascism controls the means of production, but allows the private owner to still own it. And these people are fascist. When a, when a senator from Texas can't even walk into a restaurant, sit down with his wife and have a meal without a bunch of these fascists getting in his face, screaming at him, we got a problem. <laughs> we got a problem, folks. If you, if you can't see it yet, you ought to be able to see it. I'm mad. <laughs> I am. I'm sick to death of them. It's time for the church to wake up and do something about this. Man, they're taking your country away from you. These people are insane. They're radicals. They've gone off the deep end. But anyway, this is what's happening. This is part of this church movement today. Market will align itself with progressive liberals 
and they'll march right on in to the 20th, into the next millennium. They will. This is what they are. They believe it. This is their spirit. Your spirit is your life, folks. And this is what they live for. This is what these people are. So the concept of evolution is rammed down the throat of the young people. 18 years after Blavatsky died in London, 1891, the Brotherhood selected Alice Bailey for further instruction. Beginning the year 1919, she began receiving messages from Tibetan Master uh, Dwal Kul. As stated by Bailey, the preparatory period began with Blavatsky and lasted from 1875 to 1890. The intermediate teachings were received and recorded by Bailey from 1919 to 1949. According to Kuhl, other teachings would emerge on a continuous basis after 1975 and be given on a worldwide scale to selected individuals. In plain words, the demonic powers now are selecting their leadership and they're filling them and they're empowering them. And there is power. Satan has power. Have you ever wondered why they're able to mesmerize so many people and draw them after themselves? This is happening right before your very eyes. One man was asked who pastors one of the largest churches in this country. He was asked, why don't you ever preach on hell? His answer was, well, people have enough problems as it is. You know, they're already beaten down in life. They need to hear something positive. But here's the problem. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable, right? Preach the whole counsel of God. Preach on heaven, amen. Preach on hell too. Because they're both real. And they both exist. Among core teaching common to the occult new age are adulation of Lucifer, the seething power and or angel of evolution. If you want to know what they think about Lucifer, read Albert Pike's definition of Lucifer in Morals and Dogma. He lays it out real good. Biological and spiritual evolution, reincarnation, karma, pantheism, man is God, nature is goddess, and the earthly kingdom of God, together with the concept of the masters and other such synonyms. Masters of wisdom, the unknown chiefs, the secret chiefs, brothers, council of nine, the ancient Ennead of Egypt, and space brothers. In her various books, Bailey lists other members of the hierarchy of masters, Master Jupiter, Master Kudhumi, Master Rakazi, Master Serapis, Master Hilarion, and Master Jesus. They're going to build a kingdom of God on earth. They believe in Jesus and they believe in the anointing and they believe in the power of the Holy Ghost. Well, pe preacher, these are Christians. No, they are not. What you're getting in here this morning by simply reading this woman's uh, work, 90% of the churches in this country will never get. Because all church is to them is a place to go to, to smile, shake hands, feel good, sing their song, part of their tradition. You know, everything's hunky-dory. We're Christians. We're all in this together. Oh, there's, all, there's good in everybody. And go home and continue to build the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God on earth. Because eventually the good is going to out is going to rule over the bad. The good are going to out, it's going to outweigh the bad. And you go right on in your simpleton mind. And I'm going to tell you right now, you're going to be here when Christ comes to catch his bride away. And you're still going to be here when the bride is gone. That's sad. And I got blood on my hands if I don't tell you the truth. And I'm 72 years old, and God's been dealing with me for 42 years, a pastor of this church. He won't let me get away with what some poor old ignorant preacher that's only been at it for a year and doesn't know which ends up. He won't let me get away with that. I've been at it way too long. I'm way too accountable. That's why I'm telling you what I am today. You need to hear it, folks. You need to hear what I'm saying. We are standing on the ramparts. Our enemy is coming. We had better be locked and loaded. You'd better know the weapon you have in your hand. I went to boot camp. They handed me an M14. They said, that is your weapon. You better learn how to take it apart blindfolded, put it back together again blindfolded, and I did. 
And they said, you better learn how to shoot it. You better, know, you better learn how to hit that target. That weapon is your life. If you lose that weapon, you'll die on the battlefield. This weapon is your life. This is your spiritual life, folks. If we didn't have the Bible, we wouldn't have any more than the pagan out here in the world's got. They don't have anything. All they've got is their shallow emotions. That's what guides them. That's what energizes them. That's what inspires them, how they feel today about something. Somebody's got to be in bad shape to accept somebody in fluid gender identity. I'm a man when I wake up, and then by noon, I'm a woman again. Then by afternoon, I'm a child. Then I'm a man before I go to bed at night. And then while I'm sleeping during the night, I don't know what I am. <laughs> and then I wake up the next day, I'm this, I'm that, I'm this, I'm that. Constantly changing. There's a website on there that's got over a hundred. Now, folks, I'm not kidding you. A website has got over a hundred different gender identities. How in the world? They came up with over a hundred beyond me. It must be nuances of identity between each major category. But it blows your mind. So what are you dealing with? You're dealing with people that can no longer think. And that's exactly where they wanted them. That's why you've got what they call groupthink. Because somebody thinks for you. It's like the guy that called up his preacher and said, Now brother, what do we believe about so and so? I don't care about what we believe. What do you believe about it? <laughs> I need to mention that when I'm talking about this. We had a brother in here a couple of weeks ago who was talking about essential oils. You remember that? Yeah. All right. He brought that up, essential oils. He had books out here in the foyer about it. Okay. First of all, let me explain something. I'm reasonably ignorant when it comes to the whole issue of essential oils. All right? But I'm accountable to you as a pastor. I'm accountable to you as a pastor. What does that mean? How many times have I told you before that these liberals, these progressive liberals, have shut down debate? There's no longer dialogue. It's our way or the highway. You remember that? How many times have I said that? You know, it, you don't think we, we're going to think for you? Well, let me tell you this. Liberal, I mean, uh, essential oils, you do your study on it. You get in there and dig it up. You find out what's going on with it. And I mean really know what's, I don't care about what somebody said. What do you know about it? Is it simply an innocent matter of somebody using certain oils to help some part of their body that they're, they're anointing something with? The Bible said he poured in oil and wine when he found that man at, at, uh, at coming down from Jericho. Remember, he poured in oil and wine. That was heart, part of the healing process, anoint with oil. James chapter number 5, verse number 14. All right. Is it simply a matter of you being simply innocent and using oil in your family for something like that? Or are you using essential oils in a more sinister way? Do you believe that by using them that you're conjuring up spirits, that you're connecting with some kind of spirit world or connecting some kind of spirit power involved in it, right? And see, I don't, that's, listen, I haven't done any reading to amount to a hill of beans into essential oils, but I can see right on the surface of it that there could be an issue with it. What do you believe about it? What are you doing about it? How far into it are you? Is it simply a, rubbing a little oil on a burn on your arm? Or are you into it a little deeper than that? Are you following me? Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. I don't take a position on anything until I know what I'm standing on. <laughs> so, you know, if you come to me and ask me about essential oils, I'll tell you I have not done the research. And nothing, nothing turns me off any quicker than some smart aleck. Who wants to come across like he knows everything. And all you got to do is listen to him for a while and you find he doesn't know anything. That turns me off quickly. You know why? Because you're talking to a proud man who is not willing to admit that he doesn't know something. Nobody knows everything about everything. But as your pastor, I'm accountable. I'm accountable if somebody tries to bring something into the church that, that is satanic, that's demonic that they're going to deal an issue like that, then I'll have to confront it. I'll deal with it. But first of all, we have to know what we're dealing with, right? How many of you know, how many, you know, don't, don't run your hand up real fast. How many of you really know that you really know what you're talking about when it comes to the whole issue of essential oils? That you've really done an in-depth study into it and you can see the gradations of application 
and the nuances of application in the family. You see what I'm saying? Do your own study. Pray over it. And if you get into something and the Holy Ghost says, back off, leave this alone, then folks, I would advise you, leave it alone. I don't care if so-and-so church down the road does it. <laughs> I don't care if the federal government puts their stamp of approval on it. What do you believe about it? And have you got peace with God about it? And go from there. And you'll find that that will help you in everything you do. I know people that talk about a chip. They say, that's the mark of the beast. Well, I don't want a chip in my hand. Do you? I don't want any chips on me. do any of that stuff. I don't want any of that. But I'm not so sure that that's the mark of the beast. Are you? See what I mean? Be careful. Do your own research. Do some praying into the matter. And then let me know what you find out. What you find out about Pat Robertson? I watched him this morning on uh, what's his show called Seven Hundred Club. Pat Robertson had a lady on there who who was a big proponent of oils, essential oils, and she was talking about, you know, you can use them for this, you can use them for that, this, that, this, that, this, that, and the whole time he had her in there, it was all simply about how the oil can be used for your own physical help. Nothing about Nothing about any other, any other usage of it. All right. Does it go deeper than that? Do you know it goes deeper than that? Have you done any research into it? Let me know what you find out. Okay? Because I'm responsible to the church. I'm accountable. I'm accountable in here. I have to give an account. So if you find out something, do, do your own research. Get deep enough into it to where... You really know what you're talking about. I'll listen to you and we'll go from there because once we get to that point, then God puts me on the chalk. I'm on, I'm accountable. I have to give an account for I watch for your souls. And so I have to give an account and same with this. You know why I'm doing this? I'm doing this because I'm a pastor and I know what's out there and I know what's trying to get in here and I know what's, I know how it's coming. I know it's tactics. I know Satan. And I know how smart he is. And I know how he can come across as so pious and so holy. And I know that. I've watched him. So they look. They put the Lord Jesus Christ with all these others. The Lord Jesus Christ is never... Watch this now. Anytime you see a list of names and the Lord Jesus Christ is part of that list, throw it in the garbage. I don't care, I don't care who it came from. I don't care who it came from. His name stands alone. And his name stands above. And any Christian will always do that. You'll always exalt the Son of God above everything. Amen. But you see this crowd right here, they, they master this, master that, master here, master there, and then master Jesus. No, he's not one of them. <laughs> he's not one of them. Um, so we now listen carefully to this. Listen carefully to this. If you don't get anything else from what I said to you this morning, Please listen to this. Spiritual evolution is a common belief within Fabian socialism, the emergent church, the communitarian church, growth movement, and the New Age movement. It will play a major role in bringing many of the world's religions together as one. The New Apostolic Reformation, NAR, is one of the fastest growing movements within Protestantism today. It emerged from the Pentecostal and Charismatic movement, teaches that certain individuals have, been, have become new spiritual beings, super apostles. This NAR teaching, NAR the acronym for New Apostolic Reformation, this NAR teaching is consistent with the New Age movement or cosmic humanism, declaring that man needs to tap into his Christ consciousness Cosmic humanitarianism, also known as the New Age movement, or pagan spirituality, is a major foundation of the NAR, the N-A-R. Now watch this. In his penetrating analysis of the New Age or the New Apostolic Reformation, Seraphim Rose notes that the spiritist manifestations, impartation, holy laughter, drunk in the spirit, roaring, barking, hissing, slain in the spirit, 
experienced in our churches are found in the occult New Age movement. The spirit that invaded the charismatic movement during the Toronto Blessing is not the Holy Spirit, said Rose, but the Kundalini spirit, the same unholy spirit that ancient Egyptians, Hindus, yoga practitioners, and New Agers are familiar with. One way that serpent power is imparted is by laying on of hands, or Shakti Pat. The demon-possessed Indian guru, Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh, was called the divine drunkard by his disciples, and according to Tal Brook, author of Riders of the Cosmic Circuit, by his millions of worshippers in India, America and Europe, and throughout the world, Rajneesh, Ra, Rajneesh encouraged his devotees to come and drink from him, meaning receive his touch. His spiritual wine was often passed on with a single touch to the head, Shakti Pat, at which his followers would collapse in ecstatic laughter. Another famous guru, Swami Muktananda, would hold meetings at which thousands of his followers from around the world came to receive his touch. They experienced uncontrolled laughing, roaring, barking, hissing, crying, shaking, as well as falling unconscious. According to veteran researcher Brooks Alexander, Lucifer's initiates and disciples have successfully assimilated occult Eastern teachings and techniques into our church and our culture. With remarkable speed and ease, Eastern and occult ideas and spiritist techniques for contacting spirits such as trance music, brain-altering drugs, meditation and yoga are being propagated to undiscerning Westerners and Americans within and without the church on a mass scale. They're filtered through the pervasive secularism of our culture. Nars, super apostles, channel this unholy spirit who they claim is the spirit of God. They claim that God has given them the authority, to, watch this, to build a kingdom of God on earth. That's a red flag. Any time you hear any preacher talking to you about, let's build the kingdom. No, my dear friend. He said, upon this rock, I will build my church. It's not up to you to build the kingdom. That's a misnomer if you ever heard one. Until Christ comes back, the kingdoms of this world will, become, will belong to Satan. And when he does come back, the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ. Revelation chapter 11. But the only time that the kingdoms of this world will become his kingdoms is when he comes and takes them by force. We're not building the kingdom, folks. And I'm not building the church. He builds his church. One born again believer at a time. One born again believer at a time. Just because you have your name on the church rolled at temple doesn't mean you're a member of the body of Christ. You must be born again. But it's quite remarkable. They are given the authority to build the kingdom of God on earth a unified and or pluralistic global church. Now digest that for a moment. Right in the Pentecostal movement and many Baptists right with it, Protestantism right with it, they want this super anointing by these super anointed prophets that are going to build the kingdom of God on this earth by force or by whatever is necessary. They're going to bring it about and they are, and if you disagree with them, they will immediately condemn you. Watch carefully. They believe they are restored apostles called and ordained by God to be the government for the emerging new order church. In order to maintain this governance, they stress strict obedience, submission to all their matters. They claim to hear directly from God. Many claim that Jesus visits them in person. These so-called restored apostles believe they are called to lay the foundation and government for the new earthly kingdom, one world church. Now, getting this? <laughs> Their goal is complete and utter control of the church and subjugation of its current governance to them. 
This is a highly organized group with a global agenda that is well thought out, well strategized, and will be implemented with military precision. The grid is in place. Our future is planned. The new apostolic reformation. Now, I've given you some stuff here. The next time you hear the word new apostolic reformation, what's going to happen? Red flags are going to fly up, and you, do, you need to do some research into it. Check these things out to see if they be so. But I have found this woman, Linda Kimball. I found her to be orthodox. I found her to be, now it doesn't mean somebody may come along and say, when a preacher lost, you didn't know about a thing she wrote 25 or 30 years ago where she said this about this and about this. And this. No, I may not have. <laughs> That's the problem. If people want to pick you to death, they can pick you to death, folks. When you quote somebody, it doesn't mean that you agree with everything they've said or everything they've done. Amen. Oh, you follow me there? Yes. That's so very important. And people will pick you once, once you're ever up in front of people for any length of period of time. The pickers will start because that's what their call is. I'm a picker. So what's God called you to do? I'm a picker. You're a picker. That's right. I pick. What do you mean? I put them under the spyglass. Pixel, you know, have you get into photography or video stuff they call pixel peeping. How many ever heard of that? All right. That's what they are. They're pickers. That's all they do. They pick. They criticize. They're like little snipers. They snipe at you. They snipe at your feet. But as far as doing something themselves, they wouldn't do anything. As far as teaching somebody, they wouldn't teach. They don't do anything. They don't minister. Because they're pickers. They pick. But anyway, one of their leaders said, and here's what he said, some pastors and leaders who continue to resist this tide of unity will be removed from their place. Some will become so hardened they will become opposers and resist God to the end. Now, here we go. Did you get this? If it's my movement and you're against me, even though the authority for my movement is nothing more than my dope head, but if it's my movement and you're against me, then you're going against God. You ever heard that before? Yep. Well, of course you have. They won't, they, in other words, they enlist God on their side just because it's them. But the Bible says to rightly divide the word of truth. Church, church growth guru and our leader, uh, so forth, yet another enlightened element claims that NAR is changing the shape of Protestant Christianity around the world and he and his fellow overshadowed travelers expect opposition from Bible-believing Christians. That's plain. Isn't that clear enough? They know. If you're a Bible-believing Christian, the only thing that's going to keep you out of the mess, folks, the Bible. If you believe the Bible. We are well into the early adoption phase of the New Apostolic Reformation when we can expect fairly strong objections from traditionalists who are threatened by change. Well, folks, I've seen the change. I've seen the change. Little girls can't go to the bathroom without worrying about some pervert coming in on them. I've seen the change. You can't stand and hold a political sign and say you stand for such and such a candidate without having something thrown in your face. I've seen the change. We have politicians who get up now and tell the people that you need to go out and you need to, you need to scream in their face, you need to, you, need to, you need to confront them. The former Attorney General of the United States, the highest, office, the highest officer in the country, got up in front of a bunch of people the other day and told them, he said, when, what was it, when we go low, when they go low, we kick them. Then he said after that, well, I was just joking or they took it out of context or misunderstood me. That's always the comeback. No, he said what he meant. That's coming from the mouth of the former Attorney General of the United States of America. We got some problems, folks. We got problems in this country. Tuesday's a big day. Tuesday is a very big day. But anyway... We could go on and on and on and on and on with what they're doing. And what they're doing is right under our very noses. And you know what I personally believe? I personally believe that if God wants to, he can raise up the leadership that we need to handle this. If we'll pray. 
The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Might into God to the pulling down of strongholds. And prayer is the number one thing. Joshua walked around Jericho and it fell flat, folks. He took Israel around it and it fell down. Huge walls of Jericho. But when he went to Ai, a trash heap, and went out there and thought, this is a little place, we'll just send a little band out here and we'll take this place. And they fell and died and ran before the men of Ai. And you know what Joshua failed to do before he went to Ai? Pray. He didn't pray. He didn't pray. He figured past victories would give him present victory, and it didn't. Mm -mm. He didn't pray. And because he didn't pray, he paid dearly for it. And so I pray. And the job gets harder. And the reason it gets harder is because more of it's coming out now. This, it blows my mind, the stuff that we have to deal with now as pastors. Boy, <laughs> I mean, it's something. Would you pray? Would you pray for me and pray for each other? We need prayer, folks. I hope we don't have anybody in here that's vacillating, that's, that's on the brink, that's a fence straddler, and you're not sure, and you think, well, maybe, you know, maybe that's the real movement today. Maybe that's where God is. That's what God's doing. No, God's not in that. He's not in that. He's not in that. He's n we need to know. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. That's right. Not lack of zeal, but the lack of knowledge. We've got about two minutes left, and then we'll, we'll close. I gave you a lot of stuff. It's hard to digest all of that in one sitting. Yes, sir. That's an ignorant man. That's pitiful to be so ignorant. If I was that ignorant, I wouldn't want anybody to know it. <laughs> Man, that's sad. <laughs> all of these people, they come up with all of this stuff, and they shine it right, but they don't want to live in that country that they want to be like. Oh, yeah, I got that right. <laughs> no. But they can think it's glory. So let them go over and live. Give them three weeks now, kiss the ground when they get back here. Yeah, a little while in North Korea, a little while in China, a little while in Russia. Yeah, yeah. They're redefining terms. Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. Semantics, big deal today. Oh, yeah. Fascist is right wing to them. They don't even realize. It's good stuff, though, Lawson. Good stuff. Well, hopefully it's helpful. Hopefully it helped. Amen. Amen. I am not a left winger. And I'm not really a right winger. I'm a Bible believer. Amen. You know, I'm not tied to any political party. We've had some sorry Republicans. We've had some Republican presidents that are leading us straight into a one world government. Just as much as the Democrats. Absolutely, folks. Absolutely. And if you're a diehard Democrat and you can't see anything wrong with a Democrat party, you've got a problem. And if you're a die-hard Republican and you can't see the problems in the Republican, you got a problem. Your first allegiance ought to be to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Yes, sir. Okay, Did I, I caught part of what you said. Say, thank the church. Is that what you said, brother? Yeah. Okay. Did you say you had a heart attack too? No. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Well, let's pray and we'll let you go. And take a little break here. Come back in a few minutes, brother. Uh, brother, dismiss us, please.